Any other announcements this morning? Okay. It's hard, it's hard to believe with uh, all the snow that we've been getting. I, I think that's kind of some, some of us go to warmer weather and we get snow, so it's kind of a cruel t punishment. Right, Ron? So anyway, uh, Good Friday, in seven last words, I've got the sign-up sheet for that that's coming up. So uh, I will be uh, going around and checking with you probably downstairs. So love to have you. It's a very powerful service. Mar um, Marge? Any other announcements this morning? The only thing I want to add is in case anyone is not um, aware of, but Betty's service is Friday the 8th here. Uh, 11 to 1 is the viewing and then a 1 o'clock service. Um, so if you can please attend. Everything is here at the church. If there are no more announcements, then let's stand for our Excuse me, call to worship. We are here because we have heard the call of Jesus in our lives. We are here to challenge and support one another to rise up and follow. We are here because we want to be God's people. We come seeking to be moved, changed, and made whole by the Spirit of the living God. Let us open our hearts to the moving of the Spirit and prepare to leave this place as true disciples of Christ. Amen. Let's join together in our opening prayer. Amazing God, you have shaped the world in wonder and mystery. With thanks, we contemplate the unseen world with all of its realities. You have created us so that we live as citizens of worlds seen and unseen. Help our creatures to live so that your spirit may become visible in our actions and relationships through the grace of Jesus Christ, who shared our earthly life. Amen. Let's join together in our opening hymn, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
Would you please be seated? What a privilege it is for us to gather together to realize, to re-experience again and again that we worship a God that is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That gives us the freedom to share our humanness, our mistakes, our sins with God, knowing that God is always there to dust us off and put us back onto the road of, of life again. So at this time, would you please join together with me in that spirit in our prayer of confession. Let us pray. O oh Christ, if we carry the name Christian, we are signs of your presence. Yet we confess that we sometimes hurt people through our pride rather than showing the way to the healing waters of your spirit. When we are discouraged ourselves, we are unable to be signs of joy or hope or good news. Forgive us and give us grace to be earthly reminders of your love. Amen. Please hear these words of assurance. Hear these words from Christ. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness, so go forth in the power of the Almighty, who forgives you and loves you. Amen.
Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading this morning is Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep you going out and your coming in from this time and forevermore. For those of you who are watching us, um, certainly welcome, always enjoy having you when we live stream these services. Uh, awesome worship team we've got, kind of switching roles and everybody's kind of just able to kind of interplace each other, which, uh, which is a good thing, because this, this is a group effort. Um, the lectionary text is going to be my message today, but it's, it's an interesting story that's sometimes ignored. It's John 12, verses 1 through 11. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume, made a pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, um, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii? Which, by the way, at that time was a lot of money. And the money given to the poor. He said, he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And he kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. And Jesus said, leave her alone. She, brought it, she bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you but you do not always have me. When the great crowd of the Jewish people learned that he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but to see Lazarus, whom he had been raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jewish people were deserting and were believing in Jesus. At this time, Dennis David will share with us uh, his gift in his ministry of music. I picked this song today uh, to give thanks for our trip that we had last week and that everything, we had a great time and we uh, got home safe. each morning for a newborn day where we may walk the fields of new moon day we thank thee for the sunshine and the air that we breathe dear Lord we thank thee we thank thee for the rivers that run all day. We thank thee for the little birds that sing along the way. 
We thank thee for the white trees and the deep blue sea. Dear Lord, we thank thee. Oh yes, we thank thee, Lord, for every flower that blooms, birds that sing, fish that swim in the light of the moon. We thank thee every day as we kneel and pray that we will bore with eyes to see these things. We thank thee for the fields where the clover is grown. We thank thee for the pastures where the cattle may roam. We thank thee for thy love so pure and free. Dear Lord, we thank Thee. Oh yes, we thank Thee, Lord, for every flower that blooms, birds that sing, fish that swim in the light of the moon. We thank Thee every day as we kneel and pray that we were born with Thy to see these things. We thank thee for thy love so pure and free. Dear Lord, we thank thee. Dear Lord, we thank thee. Thank you. And Ken and Marge, thank you very much for that wonderful trip we had. They did all the planning. And we thank you for the beautiful music in your ministry, my friend. All right. Put on your children's heads, hats, whatever. Call that jet lag, whatever you want to case. Today I'm going to talk about extravagance. What, when I mention the word extravagant, what comes to mind? Over Any, the top. Over the top. Can you think of giving an example of something over the top? I mean, for instance, say, Kay, I don't know if you wear perfume or whatever, but I mean, in a very expensive perfume, would you use the whole bottle? No. No. What happened if you use the whole bottle? And David's kind of chuckling. <laughs> or you get in an elevator with somebody and they would just like, right? Because we've all been in an elevator when somebody's had um, too much cologne or too much perfume, you know. Um, anything else? So that's kind of what we're thinking because we're going to be talking about perfume. Anything else? Extravagance. What does it mean to love with extravagance? I think of the Taj Mahal. Remember the story I told you about the Taj Mahal? a few sermons ago, several sermons ago probably at this point, where a guy's dead wife, he wanted to build a monument to her. Very extravagant, very expensive kind of thing. So today we're going to be talking about love's extravagance. All right. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? God, may the words which I'm about to utter and the privilege that I now assume be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Well, Sharon, you can probably sleep because you've read these sermons already. She always gives me approval or disapproval, never disapproval over whatever my message is going to be when I give it because that's then passed on. You know what? I know what love looks like. You know, it looks like $1.11. $1.11. That's all the money in the world that this little, little girl named Tess had to her name. Money she had saved up. Let me tell you about Tess. Tess was a precocious, typical eight-year-old little girl full of curiosity. And one day she heard her mom and dad talking in a very serious and somber, adult kind of conversation about her little brother, Andrew. Tess didn't understand everything that they were saying, but she got the gist of it. 
My little brother, Andrew, was very, very sick. And they were completely out of money. They would have to move out of their house and move into a small apartment because mom and dad didn't have enough money to pay the doctor bills and the house payment at the same time. On top of that, only a very expensive surgery could save the, her little brother, Andrew, now. And they could not find anybody to lend them the money. Just then, Tess heard her dad say to his, her cheerful mother in a whispered desperation, only a miracle can save Andrew now. So Tess, she ran to her room, pulled out a, a glass jelly jar where she, from its hiding place where she kept all this money she was able to scrape together and she kept in her closet. She poured out all the change on the floor and she counted it out very carefully. She then put the change back in the jar, put the jar under her arm, slipped out the back door and went down to the local Rexall drugstore, six blocks away. The pharmacist was talking to a man very intently, and at first he didn't notice Tess standing there, because she was short, little girl. She waited patiently for a while, and then dramatically <clears throat> cleared her throat, but still no luck. The pharmacist did not see her, or he didn't hear her. Finally, Tess got his attention by taking a quarter out of the jelly jar and tapping it on the glass counter. That did it. The pharmacist noticed her and said, just a minute, honey. I I'm talking to my brother from Chicago that I haven't seen for ages. Well, said Tess, I want to talk to you about my little brother. He's really, really sick. And I want to buy a miracle. His name is Andrew, and he has something growing inside his head and my daddy says only a miracle can save him now. So how much does a miracle cost? I have the money here to pay for it. It's all that I have saved. If it isn't enough, I will get the rest. I really will. Just tell me how much a miracle cost. The pharmacist's brother was a well-dressed man standing there in a suit. He stooped down and he asked Tess, what kind of miracle does your little brother need? I don't know, Tess replied with her eyes welling up with tears. I just know he's really sick and mommy says he needs an operation, but my parents can't pay for it, so I want to use my money. How much do you have? Asked the man from Chicago. One dollar and 11 cents, Tess said proudly. It's all the money I have in the world, but I can get some more money if, if, if I need to. Well, you're in luck, the man said with a smile. One dollar and 11 cents is the exact price of a miracle for little brothers. He took the money in one hand, and with the other, he took hold of a mitten, her mitten, and said, take me to where you live. I want to see your brother, and I want to meet your parents. Let's see if I have the kind of miracle you need. That well-dressed man from Chicago was Dr. Carlton Armstrong, who happened at that time to be a noted neurosurgeon. The operation was successfully completed without charge, so she got her dollar and 11 cents back. It wasn't long until Andrew was home again and doing well. Now, it always does turn out this way, but in this case, it did. Tessa's mom and dad were so grateful they were talking one night about the chain events that had saved Andrew's life. That surgery, her mom said, was a real miracle. And then she said, I wonder how much it would have cost. Tess smiled. She knew exactly how much the miracle cost. One dollar and 11 cents. Plus the skill and graciousness of a great doctor and of course the gracious sacrificial love of an eight-year-old sister. Someone might say, well, it's only dollar and 11 cents. What a joke. But that's all she had. Kind of like the widow's mite. She'd given all that she had to save her little brother and that is an extravagant gift. The little, this story of little Tess and so many others like it are examples of what's going on in our text for this morning. It's all about love's extravagance, really. It's setting the stage for Jesus and his passion narrative, which was soon to follow. 
When we truly consider what Jesus did for all of us, we are moved to love extravagantly. We can't help ourselves if we really consider it. Picture this scene. The disciples were reclining on the floor, as was often the case, probably on mats around a low table, eating from a common bowl, dipping chunks of bread into olive oil. Suddenly, a woman kind of crashes their party, and, and she has this flask that she breaks a perfume. She broke this, she snapped the neck off because that's how it was sealed in those days, meaning, she, meaning that she'd have to use the entire flask and poured out all of the per, costly perfume. The magic of nard and the pleasure of this perfume is, is, is made clear in a phrase from John. And the house was filled, filled with the fragrance of the ointment. Imagine a fragrance so extravagant, so expensive, that it just, it, it, its fragrance not only would fill the whole house, but it would linger. Spikenard was the favorite perfume of antiquity. It got its name from the spike-like shape of the root and spiny stem of the herb plant that was found high up in the Himalayan mountains. The Greeks and Romans loved the smell of this rare perfume and ointment. They were, they were virtually indistinguishable, so much so that they were willing to pay the expense of having this nard which is what it was called, shipped long distances, which means a lot of money. The best spike nard was imported from India in sealed alabaster boxes, costly containers where were opened only on special occasions, such as a death. The cost of the perfume was 300 denarii. Now, what does that mean? Since one denarii a day was the worker's usual salary, this one jar of perfume represented one labor labor salary for almost a year, 300 days of the year. Or in today's money, almost $30,000, probably more. If the nari were translated into pieces of silver, Jesus was crucified for one-tenth the cost of the perfume. In Jesus' circles, this kind of extravagance, a year's salary for a moment of luxury was unheard of. It was almost blasphemous. Given sparknards, high price tag. The reaction of Jesus' disciples to this alabaster jar being broken is understandable. And what was their reaction? They were irate right with Jesus and infuriated with the woman. Here was a woman who broke, the, broke into this company of men carrying the most expensive perfume of the ancient world. Here was a woman who took it upon herself to anoint Jesus during a meal, not before it. It was the disciples' last straw. Unheard of. Jesus had said, let the children come unto me. One thing is clear. Whatever meaning scholars may attach to Mary's act of anointing Jesus with precious oil, it was without question an act of love and kindness and graciousness. It was an act of extravagant love. There's something else we need to consider, I think, in reflecting on this particular text. It was a sign of honor to anoint a person's head with oil. We have that in scripture. But Mary did not feel worthy to anoint the head of Jesus, so she anointed his feet. She never dreamed she was good enough to do that, and she wiped his feet with her hair. A risky act, an act of extravagant love. Love's extravagance. It gives all that it has to give without consideration of the cost only wishing it, wishing it had more to give. That is the love of Christ. That's what the cross represents. I'm reminded of the classic story written by O. Henry. You've all heard it. Very similar to what the story I just shared. It's a moving story called The Gift of the Magi. A young American couple, Della and Jim, were very, very poor, but very much in love. Each had one unique possession. Della's hair was her glory. When she let it down, it almost served as a robe. Jim had a gold watch, which had come to him from his father and was his pride. Something passed down. It was the day before Christmas, and Della had exactly $1.87, not $1.11, $1.87, to buy Jim a present. So she went out and sold her hair for 20 bucks. And with the proceeds, bought a platinum fob for Jim's precious watch. 
When Jim came home at night and saw Della's shorn head, he stopped as if stupefied. It was not that he did not like or love her any less. For she was lovelier than ever. Slowly he handed her his gift. It was a set of expensive tortoise shell combs with jeweled edges for her lovely long hair. He had sold his gold watch to buy them. He should give the other all that they had really to give. Real love cannot think of any other way to give. And finally, this story experienced by a missionary surgeon, because this story of, of the woman and, and the spike nard in Jesus' text is so rich with meaning. A, a missionary surgeon who stopped by a poor peasant's hovel to see a woman on whom he had performed surgery, she and her husband were dirt poor. Their livestock supply consisted of one Angora rabbit and two chickens. That was their livestock, Dave. For income, the woman combed her hair out of the rabbit, spun the hair into yarn, and sold it. For food, she and her husband ate the eggs from the chickens. The woman insisted that the missionary surgeon stay for lunch. He accepted the invitation and said that he would be back for lunch after he'd gone down the road to see another post-operative patient. An hour and a half later, he was back. He peeked into the cooking pot to see what was going on and what he was going to eat. He saw one rabbit and two chickens. The woman had given up their entire livestock supply, her income, her food, everything. He wept unashamedly as he told the story, no doubt for the hundredth time, to an audience. He concluded by saying, the incident will stay with me forever. Love does that, doesn't it? They'd given up everything they really had to honor him with a meal. The anointing story inaugurates the final days of Jesus' life that we're about to embark on. In Mark's gospel, Jesus' passion begins with a story featuring one of the last acts of kindness that Jesus received while upon earth. And of course, the greatest act of extravagant love is when Jesus goes to the cross to show the world just how much all of us are loved, loved extravagantly. Amen. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the story of the woman who broke into that dinner party just before Jesus was to go and have his final days leading to the cross and to anoint him with her expression of love, extravagantly. Help us, God, to be those so inspired that we, too, can love with extravagance. Amen. This time, I'd like to find out what prayers of joy or concern would you like to share. Of course, I'll share by, and as, as a custom, I will walk around. But I would like to share, first and foremost, just a reminder uh, to be with Betty and uh, her family. We will be celebrating her life here at church next Friday at 1 o'clock. At 6 o'clock that evening, I will be doing a funeral. Some of you may remember this story. Uh, Keith Habenick was on a bicycle, hit and run, killed by a hit and run driver from Menominee Falls. Um, and um, this was 2015. And I remember being at the scene and helping with the death notification. It was, you never forget those when you work in that world. Um, and, but I got a call thinking, could you do a funeral on Friday? And they, just, I, and they said, you did a, fa a, fu a funeral for the family before, but um, I, I was thinking, well, I've already got Betty's funeral, our church family member. And they said, can we do it at six o'clock? And I said, yeah, who is it? And they mentioned the name of his wife, Michelle Haverney. She had uh, been in surgery for a broken leg at the age of 55 and died. So um, I ask you to keep them, certainly my friends, my dear friends in Ukraine, who are heroically battling the, the Russians uh, as well. So at this time, I'd like to what, find out what prayers of joy or concern we have. But before I do that, I'm going to say, Christ in your mercy. OK, so I see Marge has her hand up. I'll wait till I get back to you, Marge.
Dennis and Haley. Yes. Okay. Uh, Dennis was leading as we had been singing in the lobby of the hotel, and we were singing lots of songs, including several of the Libby songs. And this lady joined us, and uh, when she left, she left a note for us, thanking us for our ministry. Oh. And I say feel free to do it because she wants to do the same thing, and how could she do it? Oh, that, that is a that's a fabulous race. Never know when we minister, right? Yes, Ken. Thank God for all the help you got on the trip. And keeping you safe. And keeping all of you safe. Here are our prayers. Other prayers this morning. I'm going forward. Good to see you. Now that you are, how's life on the other side of 80? <laughs> it's good. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? Yeah, oh, yeah, Patty. My family would like to thank all of you for your prayers for my brother-in-law, Al. For Al. He did pass, and he's now in heaven with our Lord. Prayers for your ministry. Here, our prayer. No more pain. No more tears. <coughs> would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, you love us extravagantly. But sometimes we aren't tuned into that. We don't appreciate that, or we get so darn busy and cluttered with our lives that we don't recognize that. God, you've heard our prayers. Prayers for comfort. Prayers for strength during times of grieving and loss. But also in rejoicing, knowing that those who have passed are now with you with no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears. For the former things will have passed away and have passed away. We rejoice, gracious God, in your love, which is unbroken in this life and for the, all that you have in store for us in those mansion worlds on high that you refer to. We thank you, God, for safe passage and travel mercies for those of us who have traveled. We thank you for love. We thank you for opportunities to minister to people and for the lessons we learn that we never know who we're going to touch, whose lives we're going to affect, whose lives we're going to bring comfort to. And like the song that Dennis sang, we thank thee and now together, heart to heart, we together pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples by praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Freely and richly has God blessed us. In some measure, we have expressed our gratitude for all that God has done and God's extravagant love. This time, Mark will dedicate our gifts of love and thanksgiving for our morning offering.
Gracious and always loving God, we would ask that you accept these gifts, which we, your people, do offer up to you, grant that the causes to which they are devoted be causes of love, given to your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray, we share, and we live. Amen. Would you please be seated? What a privilege it is to share in these elements, representatives of sacrifice, of extravagant love, the most extravagant love the world will ever know. So in preparing our heart for that, would you join together with me in our invitation? The table is now prepared for us. We are invited to share in the feast of God's presence, celebrating here and now all that is meant by being alive. At this table, we celebrate Jesus, who touched our brokenness with his life, who gathers us together inside and out. We give ourselves to that wholeness, moving from hurt to happiness and from darkness to light, filling our lives with love, laughter, and each other, and joining with all created things to say, holy are you, O God. Jesus, when he gathered in that prearranged upper room to celebrate what we call the Last Supper with his disciples one last time, took bread as was a custom. He blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And as was a custom, he took and he poured it into a cup from which his disciples would drink. And he said, this is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. So it is our privilege to share in the bread of life and the cup of love. Would the ushers please come forward?
Remembering that Jesus is the bread of life, let's take and eat. And remembering that this is a cup of love, his extravagant love poured out for us, let us drink in remembrance of him. Would you please rise and join together with me in our prayer of thanksgiving? Let's give thanks. We give thanks, O oh God, because in your own free gift of love, you have reached out to us, you have refreshed us at your table, touched our deepest needs, and called us to a life shared in memory and hope. Send us forth with courage and joy, in the name of Jesus Christ, that we too may become bread and peace for one another and for the world. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.